Hi folks, so today I wanted to speak about the laws and legislation concerning self-protection. What you can do, what you can't do, what is morally correct and what is not, okay? So obviously uh, different countries, different states, different laws, different legislations, okay? But it's a, it should be common sense really, yeah? So really what it is, is that you have the right to, if you are attacked, you have the right to defend yourself and use reasonable amount of force to deal with the situation and to defend yourself. That means that, in other words, the threat has to be actual and real. So there has to be a real threat for your life or for the life of people around you, okay? It has to be actual, meaning that it has to be happening right now, okay? And if these are the case, if this is the case, yeah, you have the right to defend yourself and make reasonable use of force. So reasonable use of force means that the level of force that you use has to be reasonable, within reason. Okay, that means that it has to be in proportion with the attack, with the threat, okay? So, if uh, somebody is just uh, eyeballing you, giving you a hard stare, well, technically, you know, they're not assaulting you. They're not physically assaulting you. So there is no need to do anything. Now if you walk, if they give you a hard stare and you look at them and you say what the fuck are you looking at or something like that, you will be escalating the problem, okay? Instead of defusing the situation, in which case you would just ignore them, make sure that they don't follow you, make sure that the situation, uh, the situation doesn't escalate in any way, but that's how you would defuse the situation, by ignoring them, yeah? Now if somebody uh, gives you a hard stare, accompanied with an insult, okay, swearing words, use of profanity, well, then again, they haven't physically assaulted you, so there is no need for a physical response. You can still defuse the situation by ignoring them, and same, you know, be aware, make sure that they don't follow you. Make sure that the situation doesn't escalate in any way. But now, there is a, there is a line, obviously, between a hard stare, is visual, an insult, is auditory, okay? Now, if somebody physically assaulted you, this is physical, kinesthetic, okay? So... Now look how one could actually lead to another, okay? Frustration leads to aggression and aggression leads to violence. So you have to treat the, the problem from the root, okay? And avoid throwing oil on the fire, if that makes any sense. So look how fast it could go. Somebody giving me a hard stare from far away if I'm situationally aware and I've got good observational skills, I'll be able to see that okay from far away yeah now they are walking towards me and their body language is aggressive that's another cue okay aggressive eye contact aggressive body language and now all of a sudden they start swearing at you okay so they look at you they point with the finger they look at you and uh, they insult you use of profanity now they could be walking towards you, that's a, that's a very good indicative that there are chances, it's not 100% that it would happen, but there are chances that they might walk up to you and physically assault you, okay? So, that's why, you know, if somebody gives you a hard stare, that's a cue, that's the first clue, okay? If he gives you another clue, he or she, <laughs> give you another clue by insulting you, walking towards you in an aggressive manner, well, 
that's when you should be alert now, shouldn't you? So, if somebody physically assault you just with a, a push and an insult, you know, somebody points at you with a finger and start insulting you, this is more of an intimidation, okay? Which is, you know, against the law as well, you can get done for that, yeah? Life threats, intimidation and stuff like this, yeah? Now if somebody uh, gives you a hard stare, walks towards you in an aggressive manner, and now they're right in front of you, and they push you and insult you, this is already regarded as a physical assault, a physical attack, okay? And you are legally, lawfully able, and you know, you should defend yourself if that happens, but your, your taking action should be in proportion with the level of threat, okay? Which means that if somebody shoves you and you punch them in the face, well, anything that you do, you have to be able to articulate it in front of a police officer, in front of a judge, in a, in a court of law, okay? So you need to think before you do, okay? Somebody shoves you and you punch them in the face, well, you're gonna have to explain what you did, why you did it, how you did it, how it made you feel, how you felt with the initial, you know, threat. All, are, all these are little things that you need to take in consideration, okay? Before you make use of force. So that's why we say avoid and escape is always a priority because then you don't have to deal with, uh, with the judge afterward, with the police, with the judge in the court and all this, yeah? That's why I always stress situational awareness, good observational skills in order to spot the problem before it's in your face and have a chance to avoid it, okay? Now, like I said, anything that you do, you need to be able to explain it calmly, okay? If you have to make use of force, yeah? Regardless of the level of intensity that you have to apply, for example, if somebody offers you deadly force, well, you will have to access that state within you and to meet his deadly force with your deadly force, okay? So, this is just how it's supposed to be. But straight away after that, you have to be able to be calm, remain calm, okay? Get back to a calm state, you know, so that you can calmly explain to a police officer what you did, how you did it, etc, etc, etc. So, this is why it's very important, folks, yeah? Now, in terms of, th th this, should be, this should be logical, okay? So, if I summarize a bit what I just said, you have the right to defend yourself. If the threat is real, actual, you have the right to defend yourself straight away, yeah? So it's not like if somebody punches you in the face and you didn't do anything straight away and after 15 minutes you felt really bad about it because your ego took a slap as well and you walk towards the guy and punch him in the face. Well, that will be late, okay? So chances are that you, you're gonna get in trouble, yeah? So what you wanna do is as soon as something happens, you have to act, okay? And the level of force that you use has to be proportionate with the threat disparity, okay? So, if somebody pushes you and you punch them in the face, you'll be wrong. Somebody pulls you a blade and you pull a gun and shoot them, you'll be wrong, okay? Now, if uh, somebody pulls you a blade and you pick a chair up and crack it on their face, make sure that the victim, the, make sure that the witnesses are on your side, okay? It is very important to always have witnesses on your side because remember folks, uh, we're in UK here, yeah? There are more CCTV cameras in here than, than anywhere in the world, yeah? So there will always be someone at his balcony, someone at his window, regardless of what time it is, they might not help you, they might be filming it on their phone, yeah? But there will always be someone that's gonna be recording, okay? So you have to look like the good guy, yeah? 
always and you have to be the good guy so having having witnesses on your side is a very important thing to do yeah because it will give you an advantage in court or in front of the police officer or in front of a judge okay so a way I'll give you a little example something that <coughs> I spoke about in my last seminar uh, to my students one of my mates in Latvia who was uh, in the security by the way and uh, he was standing next to the bar okay that was in Latvia in Riga and um, one guy pulled the blade at him okay guy pulled the blade at him and started to threat him but he was quite low-key low profile about it yeah and what my mate did he grabbed the bar stool and cracked it on his face and uh, as far as I'm concerned he did the right thing yeah he didn't do the wrong thing by uh, by doing what he did but what happened is that the blade hasn't been found yeah the blade hasn't been found so the only thing that has been seen by witnesses was him cracking a chair on somebody's face and they didn't find the blade so he got arrested and he got prosecuted for it okay so what would I have done differently yeah in order to avoid prosecution because you know it's always like uh, <laughs> it's a double-edged sword really because you have to deal with a dangerous situation and make sure that you get out of there alive and in one piece yeah and protect your family if they are around and then you have to win the jur juridical battle you know the, the court and you have to face a judge and you have to win the case you have to defend yourself in a court of law so you have to defend yourself in real life avoid dying and then if you cause too much damage you have to defend yourself in, in a court of law in front of a judge okay so what could he have done differently in order to avoid uh, what happened to him in order to avoid being prosecuted yeah he could have obviously grabbed the bar stool to create distance that was a really good idea okay and even though the guy had a blade he had a chair uh, there was no threat disparity there was no disparity between the threat and uh, the, the level of force used okay so but the problem is that the only thing that witnesses have seen was him cracking a chair on them okay so he could have grabbed the chair and started to yell really loudly drop the knife drop the fucking knife drop the fucking knife now so that everybody know what was going on okay if i grab a chair and i start swinging it at someone what is everybody going to see they are only going to see me swinging a chair at someone and when the police arrive and they ask witnesses yeah the version of facts well they're gonna say we've seen that big guy grabbing a chair and cracking it on the other <laughs> space yeah now if you grab the chair to create distance everybody's gonna start looking at you if you start shouting drop the knife drop the fucking knife now drop it yeah when they see you they're gonna hear you so they're gonna have a visual cue by seeing you and now you're gonna give them an auditory cue by speaking to the guy by giving him orders okay as soon as you do that as soon as you give them auditory cues they're all gonna look at the guy who's in front of you and they're gonna look at his hands and they're gonna see the knife and that will reverse the situation okay that will reverse the roles all of a sudden you will become the good guy okay because the other guy's got a knife and now that will obviously the guy will probably run away because he's been discovered by everybody or he's fucking not and he's gonna try to attack you and in that case you can crack the chair on his face you know and do that or use the chair in a more efficient way you know use the, the chair as a shield more and use the legs of the chair as a as a thrust you know as a spear okay which are a thing that we're gonna work on in some of my future seminars anyway but all that was to say that Knowing how to fight is one thing, it's very important obviously, but more importantly than that, yeah, situational awareness, good observational skills, threat recognition is very important, because if you're good at it, you will spot the problem before it happens and you will do everything to avoid it, to prevent it, 
okay? Action always beats reaction. It's always better to know what's happening and, and act first, preemptively. Not necessarily preemptively strike, okay? I'm going to speak about that in a bit. But preemptively escape, preemptively do something, okay? So now, in terms of preemption, yeah? It's a very difficult and controversial subject, but in terms of preemption, if uh, you are with your family standing somewhere and uh, somebody, uh, an individual is approaching you, for example, and obviously if you are trained, you will, uh, you know, you will know what your proximities are, your personal space, and you will not allow them in your personal space, okay? You will have some sort of situational control, some sort of fence up in order to you know, control the situation as much as possible without letting them know that you are actually controlling the situation. So it takes practice. You can practice in front of a mirror to work the fence, okay? If anyone is familiar with Geoff Thompson's, who uh, created uh, the fence, okay? Which is a, a disguised guard or a, a, a passive guard, a, 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 an active guard without looking really uh, aggressive, okay? Which gives you the opportunity to react, to cover up, or to be preemptive, to preemptively strike, if need be. Now, now to, to go back to that example, so you are with your family, okay? So you have responsibility, you can't just run away, which is something that I would, um, you know, not be ashamed of doing if I had to, okay? If uh, avoidance, if escape is the best solution, that's... That's what I'm going to do, okay? Now, if you've got your family with you and you cannot escape, it's not in your options. Or if you're a security guard or a police officer, yeah? And you have responsibilities. You can't just run away and hide, okay? So, the person is coming towards you. You have some type of situation or control. You have a fence halfway up. You're talking to them. You're asking them what they want, okay? And... Uh, Already you can sense when they're approaching you that their energy, there's something wrong with their energy, okay? So that's your first cue, okay? So that's already your cue to be ready, to have your fence halfway up, to have some type of situational control, not to be all totally square up to them on your feet and to have one foot behind the other, not in a, not completely bladed because that looks, you know, aggressive, but uh, in a way that if you're being, all of a sudden, if you're being pushed, that you're not going to fall to the floor, you're going to have some type of balance, okay? And now, they're in front of you and they look weird, there's something weird about their energy, so you keep your distance, yeah? But they try to approach you, you tell them to stay away, so you have a fence and now you have a verbal fence, okay? You reinforce your physical fence with a verbal fence by telling them to stay away. And now, they don't want to stay away. They're moving towards you and now you start warning them and posturing. Listen, mate, I told you to stay away. You stay away from me, mate. I don't know you, okay? And now all of a sudden, they're in front of you and they're still walking towards you and all of a sudden, they shift their weight and their hand disappear in the background and they're reaching for something. I'll let you imagine this type of situation. Are you going to wait for, uh, for a confirmation that he is about to assault you. Are you going to wait for that? Because let me tell you something. Most of the time, 90% of the time, the confirmation will, for, will come in form of assault. Okay? And now if he's uh, reaching for a weapon, okay? If he was only reaching for a pack of cigarettes or a mobile phone, he would be standing square at you and he would just be reaching what he needs to reach. Okay? Now if he's turning, it means that he doesn't want you to know what he's reaching for, okay? So that's your cue, either to take several steps back and grab your family and start walking away while looking back and make sure, you know, or tell your family to walk away, to run, okay? Or it's your cue to preemptively strike him or preemptively flank him, yeah? So that you can see what he's accessing. Now flanking is a really good um, measure to take when you have somebody in front of you who's shifting his weight and his, uh, his hands are obscured in the background, he's reaching for something and now you start flanking him by, by checking his arm and now you see what he's accessing. If you see a weapon, boom, now you can preemptively strike. And if you are in a court of law, okay, you will be able to explain that, what you did, 
I, I told the person to stay away. He was looking really weird. I was uh, with my family. I was waiting for the bus or something. Yeah, the guy was looking really weird. I took my distance. I kept my distance, but the guy tried to stay to to get closer to me. So I told him to stay away, and he didn't want to listen to me. He looked kind of aggressive, and now all of a sudden I've seen him reaching for something, and he didn't want to let me see what he was reaching for. So I got really uh, scared for my for me and my family. Okay, and uh, I preempted. I stro I stroke first. Okay, and. Uh, and now you see that he had a knife, so you continue your assault until he, until you know, until he doesn't pose a threat anymore. Okay, so the police will ask you, oh, how hard did you hit him? I was afraid, sir. I was afraid for my life and for my family. I hit him as hard as I could, which you will. Okay, if you're afraid it, with the adrenal stress, you're not going to hit as hard as in the gym anyway. So you know, your your motor skills will be decreased depending on how hard you train. Okay, uh, now. They will ask you, why did you continue hitting him? Well, sir, the guy had a, had a knife, had the weapon in his, spot, in his hand, and he just accessed it. And I struck him once, and he didn't let that weapon go. So I struck him until he let that weapon go, until he was on the floor and not posing a threat anymore. Okay? What did you do after? I called the police straight away. I, t I put my, my family in a taxi, and I stayed there, and I, you know, so... The legal point, from a legal point of view, okay? Now if, uh, <clears throat> another example, somebody is shifting his weight and all of a sudden you see them, their hands are moving, like they're telegraphing, they're about to punch you. If you're trained, you will preempt and punch them first, okay? Now you punch them, they fall, you try as much as possible to assist their fall, you know, to avoid them from hitting their head on the pavement and kill themselves or, or have brain damage, yes? So you have the presence of mind, you know, to care enough for them, even though they are the one assaulting you, to care enough for them to avoid, to prevent injuries, okay, unnecessary injuries, okay. Now, let's say you punch somebody and you knock them out, okay. Well, you'll have the presence of mind to put them in a recovery position, lateral, you know, recovery position, and uh, ring an ambulance, ring the police, okay. So... <clears throat> this is really what, what what's happening here and then there are different types of scenarios okay if it's daytime and there are people around and you can stay around you can ask somebody to call the ambulance ask somebody to call the police but it's better if you do it yourself but you know you, there are different types of scenarios now if it's in the middle of the night if you're street smart you're not going to be in the middle of the night with your family you know at three o'clock in the morning uh, in the dark street okay that's called being street smart okay but if you are alone and you are in this type of situation where you're in a, you know, you just come back from a party or whatever and you're, you're parked a bit further and now you have to walk to get to your car, okay? And you get jumped by, uh, you get jumped by one guy or two guys, okay? And if you're lucky, if you're trained enough, you manage to deal with them accordingly. You're not going to wait and see if they have a third mate or a fourth mate, yeah? Because maybe they do and maybe they have a weapon. Always expect that there is more than one assailant and always expect that at least one of them is going to have a, a concealed weapon of some sort, okay? You don't want to take the risk to wait and see if, uh, if they got a mate, you know? Because now you're dealing with multiple armed assailants, which is the worst case scenario. And, you know, the chances are that you're not going to make it out in one piece, okay? So... <laughs> Obviously, the goal of this, this, this little video today was the law, the legislation, the legal aspect of, you know, fighting, okay? Now, fighting in the ring is fighting in the ring. It's different, okay? It's great for attributes. I like to do it as well. But it's completely different, okay? You have to be able to remain calm. So that's why I said to you, you have to be able to access this, this animal instinct on a switch, and you have to be able to switch it on, on demand, yeah, and switch it off, on demand. Because if you're fighting someone and all of a sudden the police arrive and you're still, uh, you're still in that, in that state, now <laughs> you're the one who's going to get arrested. And the chances are anyway that you're going to get arrested until they figure out what happened and, you know, and, you know, so you have to be able in an instant to switch on and switch off. Okay, 
switch on, fight for your life, become ferocious, tenacious, do everything that you have to do in order to survive and prevail and win and go back home to see your family, okay? Or, and then after that, switch off straight away. You should be able to take a nice deep breath in, slow, lower your heart rate, okay? And make conscious decisions again. So get that cognitive shift again, back to normal, back to prefrontal lobe, back to conscious thinking brain that makes decision, linguistic brain, language brain. How to switch, I made a video not long ago, how to switch from your language brain to your fighting brain. Well, it is equally as important to be able to switch from your language brain to your fighting brain. It is equally important to be able to switch from your fighting brain to your language brain as fast as possible in a fraction of a second if you can. So these are stuff that has to be trained, okay? You have to train under pressure. That's why we do pressure tests and stress tests. And we add difficulty to it. We add fatigue and disorientation so that you get as close as possible to what you would feel, okay? The adrenal stress, the tunnel vision, decrease of decision-making ability, hyperventilation, you know, and the cognitive shift. You have to be able to go from your fighting brain to your language brain as well, straight away, so that you can calmly speak to a police officer, tell your name, your address, what happened, what, what, what you did, how you felt, why you did what you did, how you did it, etc, 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 okay? So, I'm gonna do some, uh, some other videos uh, on the legislation, okay? More in detail, okay? But that was just like a, a little video to let you know that, you know, you might see me do some crazy videos where I, uh, where I display a level 10 use of force, which is deadly force, which is designed to deal against deadly force, okay? But it doesn't mean in any way that uh, this is what you should do in every situation, okay? Most likely that you will never have to use that type of force, that level of force, okay? But it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing to train it, okay? So to all people that disagree with that, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but to me that's the way it is. If you don't train it, you're never gonna, it's never gonna be part of your response should you ever need to have it as part of your response. Your brain, your subconscious mind is like a disc, okay? You have to burn information on that disc. Repetition is the mother of all skills. In order to have something burn on your disc, you have to practice it and practice it and practice it under pressure to make it more realistic so that your brain is able to perform under pressure, okay? So, as I said, folks, very important. Train lesser degree of force, okay? Train, take down, train to, to verbally uh, reinforce with a fence, okay? Train to posture, tell people to stay back, look mean, train that type of stuff, okay? Train takedowns, restraining movements rather than impact punches, kicks, elbows, headbutts and all that. But train impact as well because sometimes the only solution is impact, okay? And obviously train also lethal, the lethal aspect of combat because much more rarely, but, but it might happen, okay? It's not because the statistics say that you're... Well, not likely to be uh, the victim of a terrorist attack to have like four jihadists jumping out of a car with machetes jumping on you and start swinging and uh, cutting stakes out of people yeah the statistic the statistics say that there are not a lot of chances that you might end up in this type of situation well don't take the risk that's that's me anyway you know that don't do not take the risk okay I'd rather be uh, a warrior in a garden than being a gardener on the battlefield. That should make sense, okay? So, as I said, train lesser degree of force and train as hard, okay? But train higher degrees of force. Train from one extreme to the other extreme. And as a person as well, you know, be extremely gentle and extremely nice with people, but be prepared to be extremely wild and dangerous if you have to, because in some situation, this is your only way out. And if your family is with you, this is their only way out. Okay? Take care, folks. Bye-bye.